Talk to Sam. Okay, 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 okay. This is the Raptors Reaction Podcast. I'm Rose Samson Folk, and you're joining me after a truly heart, not warming, a heart dissolving, heart crushing loss to the now five and three Boston Celtics, 126 to 114. The Raptors now one and five, and truthfully, the game was a lot farther apart than the 12 point deficit might seem to indicate. Truthfully, the Raptors had a hot start, came out guns blazing with that three-point variance that they like to flex, which also showed up later on in the game. But they they scored a bunch of points early, jumped out to a big double-digit lead, as they are wont to do this season. And then, quite frankly, uh, very quickly and uh, politely handed the lead over to the Celtics and then watched as the (laughs) pick-and-roll and Peyton Pritchard, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, just bludgeoned them to death. And the Raptors, they didn't have the tools to keep up in this game in any capacity. They looked so thoroughly outmatched by a better team. And Raptors fans should have a good idea of what a thoroughly outmatched team looks like because the Raptors have been that team many times before. And the bad news is the Raptors looked exactly like the horrible teams that the Raptors used to beat up on. I tweeted this out, and it's, <laughs> and I think it's true. The feeling I have right now, right, is that to go from we're getting Giannis, which is what the Raptors were thinking for a long time in the Raptors fan base, to whatever this is, is quite frankly, it's Scooby Doo villain levels of comeuppance. The Raptors were bad in this game, they've been bad this season. Truthfully, any lead they've <laughs> any lead they've held this year has been fool's gold because they're just riding the high of a few strung together made three pointers. At this point, I think that is unequivocally the answer. Prior to this game, in his media accessibility availability, I should say, Nick Nurse was commenting about how he wanted more size, how he didn't want to put another small guard out there that kind of stuff. And obviously the fan base responded with, what about Malachi Flynn? Are you not going to play him? And then the first guy off (laughs) off the bench in this game was Malachi Flynn. So maybe even Nurse is adding in some of this chaotic energy, right? Just once the team's playing bad, they don't even get to play in Toronto. He's just going to mess around with the media. You know, he brings out that draw, answers (laughs) very, very earnestly that the Raptors don't have enough size that they can't rebound, and he's focused on defense. Meanwhile, the Raptors have a top-five defense going into this game per defensive rating and a bottom-two, bottom-three offense. And so that seems counterintuitive, right? Then he proceeds to play the small guard. The Raptors have a good defensive first quarter. And then pick-and-roll defense completely, they are bludgeoned, like with a cleaver. I guess a cleaver wouldn't bludgeon you. They are bludgeoned with a hammer of sorts over the rest of the game as Tatum, Peyton Pritchard, for whatever reason, and Jalen Brown get downhill repeatedly, cause a lot of problems. And I just think, I mean, it's funny as a bit, right? Like Nick Nurse coming out and saying, right, I'm not going to give you any of this kind of stuff. We've got to play better defense. Matt Thomas, Terrence Davis, they just haven't been good enough, right? So just doing that. And then going the complete opposite way of what he said he was going to do. It's funny. I don't know what went on behind the scenes, but I think that's hilarious. I respect it, to be quite honest. In the game, though, I mean, yeah. Started off Raptors canning triples. Fred, Pascal, everybody above the break threes, banging them in. Hey, the Raptors are good again. The fool's gold that I talked about prior to this. That's exactly what it was. As soon as they stopped falling. The Raptors were at a complete loss for how to create offense. And, you know, even when they would create good looks going downhill, the defense rotates over, a little shovel past Aaron Baines. That dude, he plays basketball like he has boxing gloves taped on his hands. Both in that he punches, (laughs) he punches wildly at other players. Okay, that's not true. But he can't catch a basketball. 
And there's no deft touch when he's trying to get putbacks. He's just punching at the ball. There is an, he does not have opposable thumbs. Aaron Baines, you're breaking my heart because you don't have opposable thumbs, my guy. The boxing glove gives you an opposable thumb, but turns out it's just meat shoved into one end of it, and now you just can't grab things, which is no help at all. Please, Aaron, I need you to grab, and I need you to put the ball in the basket when you have layups delivered to you. Unfortunately, in this game, uh, that was not the case. He could not do anything. So the Raptors, when they get downhill, when they get near the basket, it's not dropping in. So they kind of lean on the three-point shooting again. If there's anything we know about this Raptors team is that that shot is going to come and go. And it did. The Celtics, they start to make their way back in. I should note, though, that the Raptors, I thought, and Baines, too. Baines, initially, I thought that his rim defense was actually pretty good in the first quarter. The Raptors pinching in on drives from the elbows, as they always do, and doing a good job of recovering. The Celtics weren't shooting the ball extremely well, but I still think the Raptors, process-wise, the first quarter was pretty good. Now, does that mean that they were a good team defensively the whole game? Evidently not, because less motion in the Celtics offense. (laughs) I mean, the Celtics just went to getting isolations when they had a matchup, going into the pick and roll, and boy, did they just spank the hell out of the Raptors once they started doing that. It was over as soon as that happened because the Raptors do not have an avenue to consistent and easy (laughs) offensive creation like the Celtics did. And the slow climb to their grave began as soon as the Celtics started doing that. And if you want to look into just how apocalyptic the mindset is around the Raptors, A quote from Nick Nurse on the defensive issues, it seems to be spreading. That's what he said. Is that not like the lead in before the title sequence cuts in on a pandemic apocalypse movie? Something like that, right? Nick Nurse, as I said at the top, he's he's doing a bit. He totally understands what the media is doing. He's just trying to be funny at this point, I think. But if he's talking about the defense in this game... Having trouble. I mean, yeah, dude, they couldn't stop anything in the pick and roll. Breakdowns come from there and copious amounts of breakdowns. Uh, It's if you're going to give up that much space, that much downhill momentum to talented scorers like Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, especially Tatum, who is just so good at bumping and finishing at the rim, then it's over, quite frankly. Right. And Peyton Pritchard, I thought he was great gnashing the pick and roll extending his dribble and attacking mismatches and switches after he took the ball back out and passing and making the right read from then on. But that's not going to happen every game. But he had a good game. He, The Raptors were victims of his in this one. If you're looking for positives, you're looking on the offensive end in this game. Now, when a game is so up and down and a team is so far behind, defensive lapses are very natural. So the Raptors took advantage of that to some extent. Would the numbers have been so blown up for some players had it been a close game? I'm not so sure. But there was a modicum of success that Pascal Siakam had getting downhill and finishing at the basket in this game. And that includes drawing free throws. Against an all-NBA defender, well, two of them, quite frankly, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, that's nice to see. The Celtics were down some players. Marcus Smart isn't there to come in for those digs on drives like the Celtics are used to having. And that does make a difference. But Daniel Tice is a good rotational defender. Tristan Thompson, you know, he had a couple bad years in Cleveland, but he's not a slouch defensively either. If you think that Siakam was playing against a real set defense, not a team that was kind of just going through the motions as they cruise to a victory, then this should be meaningful at least somewhat. Fred Van Vliet continues an excellent run of play. Last game, he was one of the lone bright spots on the Raptors. He had 35 points in this one, and he was phenomenal off ball. He found a lot of space for himself. He killed it from downtown. He shot 67%, 6 of 9. Really nice to see. That is all you could ask for from Fred, and more, actually. If he's going to shoot, what is it, like... 65% from the floor and give you 35. Don't ask for anything else because that's silly. He was fantastic, honestly. Malachi Flynn, as I suspected, was not 
world changing as a player. Although his defense was fine for the most part, he had a bailout three point foul on Jason Tatum, a couple gaffes, but not a super big deal. I think he operated perfectly fine as a third guard. He did not put up like any meaningful stats in this game. He, they, I remember one play, they ran a stagger screen for him. He let it flow into a pick and roll for Pascal Siakam. Siakam found Boucher on the roll. That was nice. That's kind of what I expect Malachi Flynn to be out there for, is to work through sets, work through actions. If there's an advantage, see to it. If you have to flow to something else and then space out the floor on the opposite side, do so. I don't think he's a radically... I don't think he's going to radically change the way that the Raptors' offense or defense looks, but... In the margins, there's some things he can do better than what the Raptors were providing outside of him, I think. And that's, he didn't have a great game, especially when you look at Peyton Pritchard on the other side, who is a small guard who is picked in the, you know, in the same draft as Malachi Flynn. There are no referendums, you know, five, six games into the season on players, and there shouldn't be. But if you're going to go positive, I think Peyton Pritchard at, what was it, 23 points, two rebounds, eight assists three turnovers. Honestly, that was a great game for him. And I think it it speaks to his potential. But I don't quite understand the hesitation that Nurse has with Flynn. He looked perfectly fine. And he was a he played three years in college and he did redshirt one year. He's not young. You're you're probably not bringing him along the same way you would a freshman or anything like that. If you're drafting a guy after four years in university in college, you probably are going to play him. That's usually how it shakes out. The the draft is a great opportunity to get an influx of talent. Malachi Flynn, obviously, is talented, even though today wasn't a huge endorsement of his game. And not every game has to be. I But I still think, yeah, I'd keep giving him minutes. I didn't mind that at all. As far as the rest of the roster, I don't see much of anything going on. OG Ananobi actually had like an off game defensively on Jalen Brown. Now, an off game is not bad for OG. What's well, it's 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 off for him, but it's not bad defense. He got beat a few times. Jalen Brown, super rapid. He's just an athletic freak. Some of the crossovers he's pulling off, the little stutter rip move to get to his strong side and finish through contact. There's a string of plays where the Celtics, I think out of like seven baskets, had five and ones in the third quarter there. That was when they were getting downhill at will. And OG As far as this game, I mean, as I said, referendums are silly. This isn't one on him, but he wasn't at his best either. As far as offensively, uh, still waiting on his corner three-point shot to come around. He is unequivocally, definitively a good shooter. I'm not super worried about OG's shoot jumper. I'm just waiting for it to come around because it's supposed to and, and it will. Kyle was good off the start. He kept plugging away throughout the whole game. Kyle is always good. Boucher brought a little bit of an offensive punch. Terrence Davis as well, although Terrence Davis suffering from the same stuff that Nick Nurse talked about prior to the game. Defensive mistakes constantly. Terrence Davis makes a lot of mistakes when he's defending the ball and when he's off ball. So he brought a little bit of offensive punch. Almost all of it came during the equivalent of garbage time, just both teams going through the motions, trying to find the end of the game. I don't think there was anything predictive or meaningful in his minutes for anybody, really, honestly. That's that's what a game like this does. It's just after the first quarter, the ball started rolling the opposite way, chasing the Raptors down the the tunnel, whatever Indiana Jones reference you want to make. It was coming after them. They couldn't get out of the way. I guess they did it in The Mandalorian as well. So uh, choose the reference you like. But there's a ball rolling towards them, and they can't seem to avoid it. It's coming very quickly. It's uh, imposing, intimidating, and large, and crushes them. They were crushed. And that means that a lot of the minutes don't seem predictive for anything. They don't seem meaningful because the tenacious level of defense that the Celtics are known for, especially from their wings and guards, just not there in this game through a lot of it. There's a lot of empty minutes. So the, the analysis is lacking, I think. But yes, they go... That second quarter, they're outscored 38 to 14. Basically, nothing goes right. They cannot create consistent looks on offense. On defense, 
Tatum is mixing in incredible shot making. The small guard, like Peyton Pritchard, he's making nice little flip shots and baby hook shots. Semi Ojale, Robert Williams, Grant Williams, all those guys chipping in where they can because Tatum has so much gravity. He draws so much attention. And so Tatum not only is just on this incredible heater. I mean, he finished with 40, I believe. Yeah, 40 points on 11 of 19 shooting, 5 of 8 from downtown. Really high difficulty on a lot of the shots, too. The Raptors throwing a lot of attention at him. He's making the right reads, the right plays. Even if it wasn't directly an assist coming from him, it's kind of side top side action or an, a hockey assist, something like that. His gravity kind of broke the Raptors' defense. Then in the third quarter, it was just straight up pick and roll play. Alex Len started the second half because they thought, <laughs> I'm sure they thought that he would be able to catch the ball better than Baines would. The problem was that they were not playing drop defense. Uh, <laughs> Alex Len was showing really high in the pick and roll. And then he, he's a slow footed big. He's a huge man. It's tough for him to move himself around the court at a pace that would say, I can beat Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown to the spot. He's not put in a position to to succeed whatsoever. And he did not succeed. The the Celtics punished them for eight straight minutes in the high pick and roll. And the Raptors just got bludgeoned going downhill. Three pointers off of the driving dish. And the Raptors were really, really trying to get to the rim on the other end. And that's where you wonder, like, is it meaningful? Is it not? Because the Raptors are oscillating between a deficit of like 11 and 22 points. And Siakam's getting to the rim. And Fred is getting to the rim every once in a while. Kyle is getting downhill. And you say, can they do this in minutes that matter? Are we seeing them turn the corner here? I hope so. It's just unlucky that they got bludgeoned in the pick and roll on the other end. That's, that's the best thing you could hope for, right? At the end of the game, the Raptors do what they did against the Pelicans, although not to the exact same degree because they were down by way more in this one. They string together a heap of jumpers. Suddenly the game looks a lot closer than it was the whole time. Brad Stevens has to check for like the last two minutes and 45 seconds, has to check Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum back in. Everything calms down from there. Everything is chill. The Raptors are not making the run with the slew of end of bench guys they had in. Yuta Watanabe got a rebound, went up the court, hit a triple. Malachi Flynn missed some shots. Basically, it was inconsequential stuff. And man, once again, I forgot to mention him because he's been so forgettable, but Norm was bad in this game. Like, he turned the corner a couple times on pin downs, and that's the best thing you can say about what he did tonight. But 16 minutes, four points, whole lot of nothing from him. They just... They're expecting a lot from him, especially when you consider how dependable he was last season. If the Raptors want to be good and apply rim pressure and hit their structured offense jump shots, they need that version of Norm. He does not look like he's anywhere near that. He's just chilling out, hanging out, not providing anything of substance as it currently stands. But man, the Raptors, they got spanked. Absolutely, they did. They were thoroughly outclassed, outplayed. Whatever adjective you want to use, the Celtics outdid them in virtually every way in this one. It is hard to choose a Reggie Evans Award winner in a game that was so devoid of intensity or passion when Reggie Evans, his, the pores of his body exude intensity and passion. And... uh I, I didn't see a lot of that in this game. I mean, I, I watch the game and I look at the team. I'm like, who the hell would I give this to? And I guess Kyle Lowry, because that's like the only guy I could give it to. Fred was surgical and clinical with his jump shooting, but he wasn't really like a hustle guy in this one. Lowry is always a hustle guy. So, man, in the most underwhelming Reggie Evans award win, ever that I've probably ever given out. I think I got to give it to Kyle Lowry. Is that depressing? Is that is that bad? I mean, the like Kyle Lowry's great, but this game, they just, after that first quarter, they had no chance to win. And 
it was, as I say, devoid of any type of Reggie Evans-esque uh, behavior. Okay, so I know a lot of people like Bob's Burgers, and I know a lot of people uh, are getting ready to dislike me, so I'm going to throw out another impression. I'll be doing Bob from Bob's Burgers as I read out the quick reaction comment. And uh, so quick reaction comment, the top one is from moderate underscore observer, and uh, they'll be speaking through the voice of Bob Belcher. Quote, uh, we can't win a lot of games in the NBA when you can't rebound and your front court gets dominated in the paint every game. This roster is going to lose a lot this year. So many guards, they have TD, Thomas, and Flynn fighting for garbage minutes. Not enough front court that you have a small forward playing center and combo guard playing small forward. Time to make moves. Don't waste Lowry's year is what I think. Send him to yeah, a contender for another contract that could be moved for picks, maybe. The front office must have seen this coming, so what's the plan? End quote. Okay, uh, Bob Belcher, thanks for the feedback. Yes, the roster is unbalanced. You're bang on with that. The front office must have seen this coming, so what's the plan? Hmm. I mean, to a certain degree, I'm sure they were anticipating a low-floor version of this team where things did not go well. Although I probably would say they were assuming that Pascal would have been able to return to all NBA second team level. If he's able to do that, this team actually, a lot of the inconsistencies or underwhelming aspects of it are immediately a lot easier to swallow. And the margins don't matter as much when you have such a positive player as that version of Siakam. He's not here right now. And even like prior to the season starting, everybody was saying how good he looked. And I don't know if that was just fluff or media or whatever it was, but teammates were saying it too. Uh, he's, he's not there. And so you're trying to look all around the roster to try and fill the hole of an all NBA player. I got to tell you, a lot, of, uh, a lot of NBA teams have tried to do this. It's really difficult. It is not a simple or small task. And usually the answer is you just need an all NBA player. So either Pascal Siakam returns to roughly the player he was before or this team fails. He's their max guy. He's supposed to be relatively what he was. And even for a lot of people, improving past that, right? That's the expectation. If he's not, the framework of this team, how it was structured, fundamentally, it just does not work. You cannot run Pascal Siakam at the four and OG Ananobi at the five and bludgeon teams with that lineup this season if Pascal is not going to be a major positive offensively. Them's the breaks, I think. As far as not wasting Lowry's time, I mean, hell yeah. Lowry is still a very, very good player. You still have a guy who drives a lot of winning. If you can put a good team around him and you just give him a puncher's chance at wherever you want to be in the playoffs, you do so. I'm sure Masai and co... Bobby Webster are looking at all available options. Nick Nurse is probably hammering out a bunch of ideas when they practice, when they go through film, all that kind of stuff. But it, it's been grim. I'll say that much. But anyway, this has been Samson Folk. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you had fun or found it informative. If you want to leave a review, hopefully a positive one, yeah, five stars and a comment saying, wow, Sam's Bob's... <laughs> Burger, Sam's Bob Belcher impression is dynamite. Something like that. Uh, feel free, because that's that's great for me. I mean, that always helps. But whether you're getting into this in the morning or at night, I'm out of here. You're out of here. I hope you have a blessed day. And goodbye.